Okay, in today's class, uh, we're going to look at the use of the word despite. Um, so let's jump into things here. Um, let's say we look at simple cause and effect while my dog barks in the background. Uh, with simple cause and effect, we'll say, uh, for example, it rained on the weekend, so we didn't go to the beach. Nothing special about this sentence at all. So we have um, two clauses that are directly linked, and we start with our cause, uh, then we link with the word so, and afterwards we have our effect. So it rained on the weekend, so we didn't go to the beach. The same thing, I can start with my effect. We didn't go to the beach, but instead of so, I link with because. And then we go with our course. That's simple. That's not what we're looking at today. Today, what we want to look at is um, some strange outcomes, um, uh, oddities, uh, peculiarities, things like that. So let's dive straight into this. Uh, let's look at the first way we can kind of understand this idea, uh, which is even though. Uh, we can use the word although, but um, I don't think it flows as nicely in a sentence, uh, even though it uh, has three syllables. It just feels better, uh, even though it, it flows nicer. And language is all about flow. Um, so we'll say, even though it rained on the weekend, on the weekend, we went to the beach. So here, we're trying to show a strangeness, um, an oddity, a peculiarity, uh, somewhat of a kind of a paradox. Um, we start with even though. So by using even though, we're telling the person that we're about to say some strange and unbelievable thing. We're preparing the person. That's why we start with it. Uh, if we want to, we can say, listen, we went to the beach even though it rained. But starting with even though has that sense of drama. And the whole point of communication is to be entertaining. Um, it's to create drama. Remember, the person you're speaking to, their mind is a teatro, their mind is a theater, and inside their mind is a stage, and you can fill that stage with anything. You can talk about boring, innocuous, really just shitty things, or you can make someone smile, you can make someone laugh, you can make someone feel, um, I don't know, feel a sense of adventure, a sense of wonder. You can make someone feel anything just with your words. Words are beautiful. People tell you that uh, a painting or a picture paints a thousand words. Yeah, but 50 good words puts you inside the painting. It's, it's a lot better. Um, uh, so let's have a look here. So with even though, let's break down this sentence here because this is our guideline. We have two clauses, right? So we have our two subjects, uh, our two verbs. And in the first sentence, we don't have an object. We only have time. But let's just make it blue for the hell of it. Uh, and we'll say that we have two objects. We don't, but just we'll leave it there. All right, so um, that's all beautiful. That's all good. This is, uh, that's me. Uh, this is our equivalent of, for example, um, our subject, verb, and object, right? Um, it rained on the weekend. Um, no, shit, what is it? Uh, even though, which we start up here, right? Then we come down to our subject. Even though it rained on the weekend, uh, we didn't go to the beach. Easy, beautiful. Or no, we went to the beach. Yeah, same thing, whatever. Now, what we're going to look at today is something a little different, right? It's the same structure, but it's a little more sophisticated. And so if even though starts here with subjects and verbs, despite starts over here, and it only cares about objects, all right, so how does that make things different? Well, first of all, we want to look at the difference between a verb and an object. And I'll try to do this as quickly as possible, but let's say we look in verb to be, right? Something very simple. And we'll say, I am uh, teaching a class. All right, so uh, how many verbs are in this sentence? Well, there's one verb in the sentence, and that's here, verb to be. Teaching is not a verb. It's an action, yes, but it's not a verb. It's an object. Gerunds are not verbs. They're objects. So in this case, the only verb is here. 
I am teaching. And the one thing we know about the simple present, or sorry, the, uh, the verb to be, is the verb to be is the only grammar that actually represents now. The only grammar. So verb to be is about being conscious in the present about how the world is being manipulated. So the verb to be can only ever be, or now can be, um, I am happy, I am a teacher, or I'm teaching a class. That's it. It can be, our object can be a uh, adjective, our object can be a noun, or our object can be a gerund. I can be aware in an instant, in a moment of my interoception, you know, how I feel internally, or as well, I can extraoception, I can judge the world. She is beautiful. Right? Or I can describe what the, the nature of things. So this is a book, right? Um, I am a teacher. I am a writer. Um, this is a coffee. And this is my daughter's cup that I stole. Um, or we can describe how we witness the world being manipulated in, again in this moment. So it, it, it's verb to be is about becoming conscious of the world around you in an instant. Nothing is temporary and nothing is permanent. In Portuguese, we say eu sou, eu estou. In English, everything is just in a moment. That's all it is. It's just this moment you observe the world and you state it. Um, nothing is permanent and nothing is impermanent. But what's important here is gerunds are not verbs. So again, if I looked at simple present, I say, I like to run or I like running, we know in both of these sentences, there is only one verb, and that verb is like, right? To run and running are not verbs, they're objects. That's important. As a verb, I would say, for example, I run every day. I ran last night. Uh, I'll run tonight. Uh, I've run... Uh, every day for the last, I don't know, 10 years, whatever. But as a verb, right, the verbs are, they're like water. They're always in motion and they never sit still, right? And they are constantly and incessantly affected by time. Time is the most important factor. So that verb is in the, in the present, the future, the perfect, the past, and it's always in motion. But if I want to talk about a verb, in the same way I talk about a book, and this is me plugging my shit, or pizza, or a person, or a concept, I can't hold water in my hand because it goes straight through my fingers. So if I want to look at a verb like, like an object, I have to turn it into an object. So we have this piece of glass here between the verb and the object. And when I bring a verb through that glass, right, it turns into ice. Now it is an object. So how do I turn um, water into ice? Or how do I turn a verb into an object? Well, I have two ways. One is the infinitive and the other is a gerund, right? It's an action, yes, but it's not a verb. It's not doing anything. We're, we're holding it up. This book doesn't do anything. It can't read itself. It's an object. I have to manipulate it. I have to read it. When we say... I like running, this is not doing the action, the action, and even I am not doing the action either. This is the action, which is to like this, to, we're talking about it in some way. So why is this important? Well, it's very important because we want to talk about things that we do. Uh, but it's also important because what we're going to do here with despite, we only work with gerunds. So we're not interested in infinitives, and we're obviously we're not interested in verbs. We're interested only in objects. Um, so if I come all the way back up here, we have this sentence here. Even though it rained on the weekend, we went to the beach. So here we're going to turn that to, we're going to start with despite. Now in this case, I'm going to leave off this subject. We can and we don't have to. Does that make sense? We, we don't have to, or we can and we, we can't. We can or we, I don't know. Either way, I'm going to leave it off. Um, and then what I want to do, I want to take this verb here, rain, right? In the, which is here in the past, and I want to bring it through. So when I bring it through, I'm going to turn it into a gerund. So we say, despite raining on the weekend, we went to the beach. And that's it. 
Now, instead of being green, that's blue. So let's dive through a bunch of these examples and we'll say even though uh, I went to bed early, I woke up feeling good. Right, so same deal. Uh, we have, uh, we're starting with, first of all, we have in both our clauses, ah, uh, both our clauses, we have the same person, right? So in this case, definitely, we don't need uh, both people. That sounds unfortunate, but it's true. So let me just make this all pretty with subjects, verbs, and objects. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Here we go. Um, so in this sentence, we don't need both people. So we can think about removing because we're not going to get confused. The only part of our sentence that matters is this part. This part tells a story. This part is a contrast, right? That's why we can work it as an object. Think of it like uh, um, shadows. In, in many of my other videos, we've looked at the idea of shadows. But the shadow just tells us a story. It tells us a contrast. It tells us why a person is happy or it tells us why we should be kind of, um, not concerned, but we, why we should be surprised that that person is happy. But it's just, this, this thing here is not moving. It's just a shadow. It can't move its arms. It's just in context. So here, again, we'll come down. We'll start with despite. And again, we're going to leave off our subject because they're both the same person. So it doesn't really interest us here. And so I want, want to work through only this first clause. So we take the verb went, right? And we bring it from here. We bring it across. And of course, it becomes a gerund. So it becomes going. And that's it. That's all I do. I woke up feeling good. Up. Oh, feeling good. Then, so let's look at how time affects things. Even though I will go to bed early, blah, 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 blah. Again, nothing, uh, nothing changes on this end here. This part here tells us the actual story. So this is where time is. This is just a contrast. So we don't need time in a contrast. It's just a shadow. So here we'll say despite, same thing. Here we have will go, but... As far as um, looking at our uh, models, right? Models are all here because time is only on this side. On this side, there's no such thing as time. All we can have is objects. So we don't need will, should, uh, can, had better, none of those. Um, so the same thing, despite going to bed early, to bed early, uh, I will Wake up feeling good tomorrow. Feeling, feeling good tomorrow. That's it. So here is where my actual story is. So this tells me um, it's my prediction of tomorrow. And here it's just contrast. And there's no difference between these two sentences. So let's quickly dive into, uh, so where we see there the, the future, the past and the present, nothing happens. They all come over and they just become adjourned. So what happens when we have present perfect? So even though I've lived in Brazil for 17 years, Jesus Christ, um, I still speak what's commonly regarded as um, Portuguese fofinho. Um, so here, now, we could, if we wanted to, and people do, say, um, despite living in Brazil for 17 years, but I want to keep the present perfect. Why? The present perfect is not a grammar, like it is a grammar structure, but it's not a time structure. Um, remember, when we think about grammar and time, there's only three times, which is the future, uh, which is now, and which is the past. So that's, for example, um, did, uh, then verb to be, and then do over here. Um, or uh, So... When we look at the present, the perfect though, the perfect exists outside of time. It's one foot in the present and one foot in the past. It's one foot in the past, one foot in the past perfect, or it's one foot in the pre in the future and one foot in the past of the future. Um, so the present perfect doesn't actually fit a time model, but it solves many, many, many problems. So it's an important tool to keep. Um, in here, right? Uh, if we say I've lived in Brazil for 17 years, what we're doing is measuring this verb. 
we're saying I live in Brazil, we're saying something that's true today in the present, which is I live in Brazil, and then we're measuring it back to a point, some point in the past, so we can understand the length of this verb, live. Um, I mentioned this before in earlier videos, and I'll come back and redo it. This is what I call like the hero complex. It's to show that you're a hero. You've been doing something for a long time. You're fantastic. Or it's to show that you're a victim, that you've been doing something for a long time, and it's unfair, unjust, and you deserve um, uh, your reward, whatever it may be. All right, so, but regardless of that, I want to keep this structure. Because once again, I want to keep the perfect tool because I'm measuring. So here, we'll just say despite. And so now I'm not going to say despite living because I have this auxiliary here. So I'm going to convert that. Despite having lived in Brazil for 17 years, I still speak Portuguese for Finho. All right, so that's one version of that. Let's look at past perfect. Even though... I had seen the movie before. I decided to watch it again, which I did last night watching The Very Long Engagement. Is that it? Fucking beautiful movie. Uh, I decided to watch it again. Uh, and that's it. So here, uh, same deal. We have past perfect here, right? So what are we going to do? We're going to convert this into a gerund. Now, past perfect if it's sitting over here and say, I had seen, well, when that had comes over, same deal. There's no such thing as time over here. Um, so we'll say, despite having seen the movie before, I decided to watch it again. That's it. Easy. Now, uh, the last thing we're going to look at, um, there are more complications than this, but um, I have to feed my cats and I've got an English class coming up very soon. So uh, I'm only going to do a quick thing, which this is not being a quick thing. So fuck it. Um, the last complication we'll look at is when I have two different um, subjects. So even though they made a lot of noise, I managed to get to sleep. Shaza, to sleep. All right, so in this case, we do. We have two separate groups of people, right? I, They and I over here. So let's just pretend we do it the same way we did before, which is um, despite making a lot of noise, I managed to get to sleep. Right, so let's say we just took this um, this verb here and we brought it through the glass and we turned it into an object. Um, the problem here is, in this sentence, despite making a lot of noise, I managed to get to sleep. This assumes that I'm the one who made the noise. If we don't have the subject here, then this subject is the one who is doing the action. So it's the same subject in both situations. So maybe I'm sleeping with pots and pans on my feet, and every time I'm about to fall asleep, I make a god awful racket and I wake myself up. So this person is very important. We need this person to make, to give clarity to the sentence. So what do we do? We can't put a subject here because why? We're dealing with objects. So the same thing we did here, where we brought a verb through and we turned it into a, a gerund, we're gonna bring our subject through and we're gonna turn it into uh, an object pronoun. So they becomes what? Them. And that's it. Now, I have an uber sophisticated sentence. So even though they made a lot of noise, I managed to get to sleep. Or, despite them making a lot of noise, I managed to get to sleep. Now, it seems strange. It seems even kind of, it looks, it looks more sophisticated. It looks more difficult. In fact, it's ridiculously easy. Um, also, the fact that we're, we're removing the verb, we're turning it to an object, means we have less moving parts, which means we have less chances of making mistakes. What you see a lot in English is sometimes, or no, more often and nearly always, uh, more advanced or sophisticated grammar is usually just about moving one piece. Uh, for example, if I, and we'll look at this another day, but if I'd say, um, uh, he is the person with whom uh, I worked 
on my first record, right? So here we have what we call our, our uh, relative clauses. We have this very sophisticated thing here with whom. Um, most natives, and this is why you do not want native English, because natives have shitty English. So most natives, if not all natives, think that whom is the formal version of who. And that's not true. Who is how you discover a subject. Whom is how you discover an object. Right? So just to show how something so simple can be so sophisticated, let's say, uh, oh shit, I have a fucking proper sentence here. Um, how I, I would divide this into two sentences. He is uh, uh, someone. So let's get rid of the person and we'll say someone here. Uh, and then, so that's our first sentence. And I worked on my first record with him. Right, that's just two sentences joined together. If I wanted to, I could um, uh, separate those two sentences with a semicolon. Semicolons, obviously only for writing's sake, um, tell us that this next sentence or this next clause directly relates and complements this first clause, but that I don't want to, um, to have a, a complete full stop. And obviously you can't use a comma because you have a continuation of our subjects. Um, so, but in this case, I don't want to do that, right? I want to have, um, with speaking, I want to be able to link the two sentences into one. So here we have to remove this. Uh, oh, no, no, we're removing that. No, well, how we're going to do that is we're going to bring our object over and put, and use our object as a way that we can link those two sentences. Um, but then to do that, I can't use with him because him is only here as an object. So when we bring the object over here, it becomes with whom. And that's how I can link two sentences. He is someone with whom I worked on my first record. Beautiful. Um, sounds a lot more sophisticated. Um, and the same thing, it's only moving one part. So you find that um, language that looks really difficult is actually easy. In fact, the difficult with anything just means it's the first time you're doing something. There's no such thing as difficult. There's just a learning process. When we first see something, it's always ridiculously difficult. Always. It's impossible even. And then the next time we do it, it's a little less difficult and a little less difficult until it's something we don't think about. And that's something that's important with learning language. Um, when you say like, how do I remember when to do this? You don't. Your brain does. You don't have to remember anything. Language is all unconscious. It doesn't really need you. It doesn't require you. Um, so uh, anytime we, we learn something new, especially even something that seems difficult or complicated, it's just repetition. That's all it is. Until the brain has it in its resource, and then the brain can use it in a moment or in a period of time. Um, and that's all. But it's always something so simple, right? It's just something that's, uh, it's always just like one little movement radically changes the whole feel of everything. Um, so let's do one more here. We'll say, even though, and then I'm going to pack up, uh, even though I arrived on time, they started without me. Now, in this case, I am here as the uh, victim the poor intrepid victim of the sentence. Um, so it's, it's not going to be, uh, like it'll still be clear if I don't have the subject, but I'm going to put the subject in now. I want to put all of this, this, uh, so let me make this yellow, green and blue for us. The subject, our verb, and here's our object, right? I want to put all of it into the sentence. Um, so to do that again, we start with despite which is over here, and despite goes only with objects. So we say despite, and then we do, we take our, our ob subject pronoun, we turn it into an object pronoun, we take our verb, we turn it into gerund, and then we have our object, and guess what? We just make one block out of that, and that becomes our shadow, despite this. So we say despite me arriving on time, they started without me. And that's it. So yellow goes to blue, green goes to blue, and blue stays as blue. And that's it. 
now we have an object. Um, all right, that's what I'm going to leave it there because I got to go work, got to go do a bunch of things. Um, and uh, as always, love the people, love you. Everybody else is a piece of shit. Um, I don't know when the last video I did was, but it was a long time ago. And um, I make no promises, but uh, there you go. Enjoy. Thanks. <laughs>